Um, we're going to talk about a tough passage today, but I'm hoping that you're going to be encouraged by it. It's uh, in Acts chapter 7, and uh, we're going to be looking at the verses 54 to 60. And what it's going to be talking about is a man named Stephen. Most people here know about Stephen. Stephen is known as the first Christian martyr. And so uh, when you think about that topic, you think to yourself, man, that's going to be hard to talk about. And it was hard to prepare to. Let me just let you know that right now. Um, but one thing I want to stress is the character of Stephen. Stephen is described in Acts chapter, the end of Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7, as a man who was filled with the Spirit. He was filled with wisdom. He was filled with grace. And so everything about Stephen exuded character. And so when we come to this story, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, why would such a man that demonstrated such integrity and such character, why would such a man be put to death? And I just want to say this. When it comes to the issue of character, it really demonstrates its true face in the midst of adversity. Amen? It really demonstrates its true face in the midst of adversity. And so I'll give you a little example, okay? Another guy on our Glide app is a guy named Kenny Young. And uh, Kenny and I, we played basketball together at Lincoln High School. And during our junior year, uh, we were playing and our team was ahead. And they took Kenny and I out because we thought we were going to win the game. Well, as we were watching it slowly unravel, they started scoring more and more and more points until finally they caught up to us. And we were looking at each other. We're like, man, get, they got to put us back in. You know, we, the lead is gone. Coach never put us back in. Never put us back in. And guess what happened? We lost. We lost. And so the character question was simply this. How are we going to respond in the midst of adversity? How are we going to respond to the fact that we lost? Because you know what? Sometimes in life you lose. You just lose. Nobody likes to lose, but the reality is, is that sometimes God ordains it for us to lose. And one of the reasons is because he wants to see how you're doing in your personal growth. And so I'm ashamed to say that after that game, I had to make a decision, and Kenny had to make a decision. Are we going to shake the other team's hands, or are we just going to walk our way into the locker room? And guess what we did? We walked the opposite direction in the locker room because the only thing that we could see is the injustice that was done to us. I can't believe they didn't put us back in the game. Sometimes when you're facing adversity, you just can't get your mind off of yourself. You can't see the big picture. You can't see the fact that, you know what, basketball is a team game. And other people are involved, but sometimes, you know, we kind of walk around like we're the sun. And everybody else revolves around us. The good thing about character is this. It can be developed. It can be developed. And no matter how many times you fail or you do the wrong thing, there's always another opportunity for you to develop character. And so when I look at this story right here, I see this man who's facing his deathbed. And he has to figure out, am I going to think about myself and what I want? Am I going to think about my life? Or am I going to think outside of myself into the big picture? Because here's the reality. As followers of Christ, some people don't like what you believe. 
Some people don't like what you stand for. And so in our culture today, for example, you know, uh, Christians sometimes are just labeled as people who aren't progressive when it comes to culture. And they'll think about Christians and they'll say things like, you know, they don't want gays in the military. Or they don't want women to have the right to choose whether or not she wants to have her child. They want to argue about same-sex marriage and they are against it. And, and our culture is constantly looking at us, even though they don't know us, because most of them don't, and they, they don't like what we stand for. And that was the case with Stephen. They didn't like what he stood for, what he taught, what he believed. You tell somebody that all roads don't lead to heaven, you're going to have people say, how dare you say that? You're just a narrow-minded person, and I feel sorry for you. That's the culture that we live in. And so the culture that Stephen lived in, they had this perception of who God was, where he dwelt, where his presence was felt. And anybody that would argue against that or else try to reason that maybe God responds and presents himself in different ways, they were looked at as hypocrites and people that blasphemed against God. But no matter who you are, there's always going to be somebody that either doesn't like you or they don't like what you believe. And they don't like your decisions. And you have to be able to respond in a way that either demonstrates or invalidates your character. I see a lot of people who are Christians, they just simply, whenever adversity is, is before them, they get defensive or they get argumentative. And you know what happens? They lose their witness. Man, that's one of the biggest problems when it comes to people outside the church. They, they look at us and we get defensive and we get mad. Sometimes we justify ourselves and we don't listen to people. And we lose our witness. You know, God gave the Holy Spirit an axe so that we would be powerful witnesses for Him. And sometimes that means you've got to lose. Sometimes it means you've got to lose. And so uh, as we look at this passage here, it starts off in verse 54, and it simply says this. It says, now when they heard these things, it says they were enraged, and they, they ground their teeth at him. And so you get this idea of people that are just livid at what, what this man is teaching. And you know, chapter 7 is this big, long chapter. And so what I want to do is basically uh, summarize this in some very key points. It says, when they heard these things. Well, this is what they heard. This was the charge against Stephen, because they basically, they presented him before the Jewish council. And they said, here's the charge against you. This guy teaches that the temple is not the only place where God's presence is felt. And this guy tries to change the customs and the traditions of Moses. So that was the issue that he, that he was being accused of. And so in this big, long discourse, he's going to challenge these issues. And so... In verses 2 through 8 of chapter 7, Stephen starts off by arguing that Abraham experienced God's presence in Haran, in a place that we know today as Iraq, back then Babylon. And God's presence, he's saying, was not restricted to Israel. In verses 9 through 19, he turns to Joseph and he said, You know, Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers, and he was sold and he went to Egypt. And God's presence was with him in Egypt. God wasn't restricted to Israel or to a temple or to a building. 
because it hadn't been built yet. In verses 23, 29 through 43, uh, Stephen talks about Moses. And he says, Moses of all people was born in Egypt. He was not born in the Holy Land. He was born in Egypt and he thought he was going to be like the savior of the Israelite people. But the people basically rejected him. And so he fled. He fled to this place called Midian. And it was there that God called him. It was there that that burning bush was there and it beckoned him. And then he says, even after Moses, you know, uh, he went to uh, Mount Sinai and he built this tabernacle and uh, the, even Joshua wandered they, before they finally even entered into this holy land. And he's saying simply this, that God was present outside of Israel. That God can be present outside of your building. And then he says, once the temple was actually built by Solomon, he said, God declared this. He said, I cannot be confined to something made by human hands. In other words, don't restrict me. And the people didn't like that because they loved their temple. Their temple represented God to them. Their temple was where behind the Holy of Holies that the priests were only allowed to go because they would enter into the presence of God. And so for somebody to say that because Jesus died for your sins that that curtain has been divided in half, for them it was blasphemy. And then Stephen's next point is this. He says, you know what? Those godly men that you mention, like Moses... Did you realize that your fathers persecuted him? Do you realize that they wanted to go back to Egypt? Do you realize that instead of following the living God, they gathered Moses' brother Aaron together and they made this golden calf and they committed idolatry? And he goes further. He says, Joseph. Do you realize it was the patriarchs that sold Joseph as a slave? And he continues to say, and the prophets, the prophets that spoke about this righteous one to come, your fathers killed them all. And so you kind of get the stage that's set. And so when it says, now when they heard these things, it says they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. You ever been so mad that you, you, argh, you ground your teeth at somebody? Man, I dated this girl one time and uh, I, I did something to her that she just, argh. I remember one of the, of the many times uh, we were going to, you know, she wanted to, we wanted to go to a bookstore. So I, I follow her into the bookstore. And, uh, you know, at, at this particular point, I had to make this decision. Do I want to follow her where she wants to go or do I want to go look at my own books? Well, I decided, you know, she'll go her way, I'll go my way. It's just a bookstore. It wasn't more than like 20, 30 seconds where she comes up to me and she says, let's go. Like, let's go. We just got here. Let's go now. <laughs> so I got in the car and I, I looked at her and I said, You know, it, it appears to me that you're upset with me. <laughs> and she said, Well, that's a good observation. <laughs> she said, How do you know that I didn't want to show you something in the bookstore? There's may have been something important for me to show you, but you wouldn't have known because you went your other direction. And I'm like, hey, I didn't mean to do that. You know, I'm sorry. And so 
Uh, she also had a dinner that she had cooked that night, and let's just say this, it was the most quiet dinner I've ever had. <laughs> the tension was just riveting. It didn't work out. Everything I did made her mad. I would, you know, turn on the radio, turn it a little bit lower. She didn't like that. She made me read Men Are From Mars, or Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Made me read that. And so when I asked her, when I, when I would talk to her, she would say, don't ever ask me, can I do something? But ask me, will you do something? Her. So every time I think about her, I think about Clint Eastwood. Make my day. <laughs> but these guys, these guys were mad. They were livid. And then, uh, um, what happens is, it's almost like they want to attack them, but they're, they're, they're barely restraining themselves, you know. They're barely restraining themselves because they are that offended that they think that God is different than what they, when, what's being taught. And so look at the next verses here. In verses 55 through 58, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit kicks in full throttle here. And it's not as you would expect. But he says, it says, But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, and he's saying this to all the people that are upset at him now, okay? He's saying, Hey guys, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that was it. That was it. It says, <laughs> check this out, kind of get this visual of your kid, you know, when he doesn't like what you have to say, but it says, but they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. Ah! And they rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. The reason they did this, of course, is because if Stephen's vision was true, then God's presence wasn't in that temple. But God dwelt in heaven. If what Stephen was saying was true, the person at his right hand was Jesus. And they didn't like that at all. And so they cry with this loud voice. Now, it's sad that they stone Stephen. But as I have been saying from the very beginning, sometimes we have to lose well. Sometimes we have to lose well. How many of us like to lose? None of us. How many of us have lost at some point in their life? All of us. How many of us handled that well? Some of us. How many of us are still on a process of getting better? Most of us. I realize that all the time, you know, when my kids bother me sometimes and Captain Yell wants to come out. Like, okay, I gotta stop yelling, man. It's not gonna help, you know. But Captain Yell's like, oh, stop him for you. <laughs> Who do you want me to yell at? <laughs> Get back in the house, Captain Yell. But it says they cried out with a loud voice. Now, now here's the question that I have. Um, why didn't Stephen? Why didn't Stephen just keep this vision to himself? Right? Because it starts out there, you know, Luke is describing this. He said, okay, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gazes into heaven, and it says he saw the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of God, right? 
Why did he just say, okay, that's it, that's all I have to do? It's because he was full of the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit and the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of power. And he had to give these guys one more opportunity to change their hearts. By, by, by pointing out his vision and telling them that, that the heavens have been opened now and there's the Son of Man and he's with God, there's one more opportunity for the people in the crowd to change their tune. There's one opportunity for at least somebody in the crowd to say, hey, wait a minute, this guy's saying he's seeing visions from God, maybe we should listen to him for a second. Maybe we should evaluate it. And so, by disclosing the vision that he saw was actually a demonstration of grace. Because he could have said, I see something and I ain't telling you. I'm going to keep it to myself, but you're going to be in trouble. But he simply says, here's what I saw. Take it and deal with it. And of course, Ultimately, they rushed him. The second question I ask myself is, why did God show this vision to Stephen? I believe it's because in the midst of the adversity and the tension and the danger, God wanted to show Stephen assurance. Hey, you might not understand what's going on. You might be scared right now, but I just want you to know that heaven is for real. That I'm present. Sometimes we go through life and we need assurance, don't we? Sometimes we go through life and we go like, why is this happening to me? Sometimes you go through relationships and you get hurt and you can't understand because you think that you're, you're doing the best that you can. Sometimes your job lays you off or fires you. And you ask yourself, man, I thought I was a great worker. And sometimes God says, you need assurance, don't you? And in Stephen's case, with this mob, with this crowd, with this anger. He gives him the Holy Spirit. He fills him with the Holy Spirit. Which if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you sense his presence there. I just can't explain any better than that. He gives him assurance and says, look up. Look up there. I'm here. Death is not the end. It's just an entrance to the future. When we go through valleys and trials and tribulations, we need that assurance. Because what is the greatest fear that we have? Most of us. Most of us, the greatest fear is death. Right? Most of us will do anything not to die. But God shows this vision for two reasons, and it's to, to remind us that heaven is for real. For those people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have committed to following him, and no matter what you're facing, heaven is for real. God, like, unzips it, shows it in HD, there's heaven. And the second thing about this passage about death is that notice it says the Son of Man was standing. It doesn't say the Son of Man was sitting at the right hand of God, but he was standing. And the second point about death that I think it's important to know is that 
Jesus awaits your arrival. I kind of see Jesus like sitting, you know, at the right hand of God like this, and then sees that you're about to enter into heaven, and he just stands up. He's like, hey, I got your back, man. I got your back. I'm standing here, man. I'm cheering you on because it's real. This is real. I'm here, and you're going to join me. You see, God provides assurance when we go through tribulations and we go through trials. Some of you in here knew Evelyn Frears. Evelyn Frears passed away a couple months or so ago. And Evelyn was this lady that she just had a heart for prayer. She goes into the doctor, they find out that she has cancer. She goes through all the testing and she's hoping that somehow that this will be taken care of. And eventually, she comes to the realization that she's going to die. And so how is she going to handle this? She's going to lose, right? She's going to lose the battle. How is she going to handle it? Is she going to curse God and say, you know, I followed you, I've served you, I've given you my life, and now this is what I'm facing? Or is she going to come to this, this point where she says, you know what? I have assurance where I'm going, and I'm ready. You know, when I think about Evelyn, I think about three things. One is when I visit her in the hospital, she said, you know, Kenny, there's a Muslim doctor that, I'm, that, that has been caring over me. And I told him that no matter what happens to me, I'm going to be okay. If God heals me, then I get to be with my family. But if God doesn't, I get to be with Jesus. Amen. And she said, do you, doctor, have that kind of assurance. Later on, when she was doing the hospice thing, she had a nurse there, and she told Pastor Darrell, she said, if she comes to Christ and I die, it'll be worth it. And then finally, when I called her up on the phone, she said, you know what? I'm planning my funeral. I'm going to have my funeral done exactly the way that I want it. And when we watched this funeral, one of the things that stood out was, you know how usually in funerals they have a time where everybody comes up and they talk about how great a person you were? She told the pastor to cut that because she only wanted to talk about Jesus. You see, when you're facing adversity, your character shines. And her character shined for Jesus. And you know what? There is no better witness than when you're about to lose, when you're about to not succeed in what you're trying to accomplish in life, when, when, when the devil brings you uh, pain and hurt and bad relationships and bankruptcy and you name it, and you handle it with Holy Spirit, character, and integrity, there's no better witness. There's no better witness. That's why people that are on their deathbed, people that have AIDS, all of a sudden we start paying more attention to them if they are living this kind of life where it's like, you know what? Yeah, don't feel sorry for me because I got God on my side. There's no better witness than that. 
And check out how this story ends. It's amazing. The last verses, 59 through 60, says, and the witnesses laid down their garments, okay? So when you look at that term, imagine like um, they, they, t- they take it off so that they could get better throw in motion, right? So they, it's like a relief pitcher. You know, you call him a relief pitcher. He has a warm-up jacket on, right? He just kind of takes it off, right? Well, they take off their jacket so that they can really fling it at him. And it says, and they lay the garment at the feet of a young man named Saul. Amazing. It's amazing because most of us know who Saul is. He would go on to become the greatest evangelist and church planner that ever lived. But at this juncture in his life, it says in chapter 8 that he actually approved of Stephen's death because he did not know God. He did not know Jesus. But I guarantee you, this left an impression on him. I guarantee you, seeing a man who's about to die, and he uttered these words in verse 59 through 60. It says, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And it says, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice and he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Oh my goodness. How? How? How could he do that? How could he do that? These guys were trying to murder him. How could he do that? Why wouldn't he say, curse those guys? It's because he was filled with the Spirit. See, when you're you're filled with the Spirit, you look beyond yourself. You have the capability of looking at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, you recognize that God has just given me assurance where I'm going to be going, but these folks right here that are pelting me with rocks, they don't have that assurance. And it grieved him in his heart. It grieved him to the point where he's like, Lord, give me one more chance to say something before you take me. One more chance to say something before you take me. I want to say the same thing your son Jesus said. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And who was the young man that was watching? Saul. Do you think Saul ever forgot that? Do you think that was permanently stuck in his mind? This man is going to die and he's going to pray that God would forgive us. It's a character. How do you handle adversity? How do you handle losing? It's your witness. You know, we sometimes think as Christians that, you know, we have to make ourselves look good before people who aren't Christians. That we have to be able to talk a certain way or, you know, watch certain movies or, you know, we have all this kind of like this checklist sometimes that just to to kind of show us, you know, show other people that, you know what, we're, we're, we're holy people, right? What? You, you watch a rated R movie? I used to watch that before I knew Christ. What? You, you listen to secular music? Well, just give it time. It took me a while to get where I am, but now I just listen to the hymnals. See, our culture doesn't need to know that we are better than them. Our culture needs to know that we are weak. 
they need to know that the reason we need Jesus is because we recognize that we are weak. See, our culture is the one that says, I don't need Jesus. We're the ones that say, I can't make it without him. And so when it comes to our witness to an unbelieving culture, Paul said it best. He says, when I boast, I boast about my weaknesses so that God could be glorified. So how do you bring it home? How do you bring it home? You got to evaluate your life. You got to evaluate your relationships. You got to evaluate your situation. And you have to ask yourself, am I demonstrating the Holy Spirit character that God desires of me? And like I said, there are times where we fail. But are you learning from that experience? Are you trying to grow through that experience? That's why this passage was written to us. It's not necessarily because we want to cry about Stephen, but it's to let us understand that a Holy Spirit-filled man can make an impact really on the world. Paul took that moment and eventually came to know Christ and spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Sometimes you got to lose. And for those of you who think sometimes God doesn't know what he's doing, you got to look at the big picture. Would Paul have been so captivated if he wouldn't have had his, been prayed for to forgive? Would Paul, if he never experienced Stephen being stoned, would he have even been receptive when God calls Stephen? What Stephen did was Stephen planted a seed, but it wasn't just a little baby seed. He planted, you know, a walnut seed. He planted a big old seed there. He planted the kind of seed that if you walk and you kick it, you're going to hurt your toe. so I just want to say this. Our character is what we have to work on. Our character is our best witness. We have to learn how to lose well because we have assurance that no matter if things don't go well in this life, Jesus is standing up and saying, I assure you, man, we're going to be together again. So with that said, I think I'm, I'm done. I think I'll shut up. <laughs> I, I just... But it's done. <laughs> no, no, my point simply is to think about the people in your life right now that you have tension with. You have two choices. One choice is simply to just ignore it. The other choice is to say, you know what, as a man of God or a woman of God, how am I going to demonstrate this is how we're supposed to live our life? You know, I told my friend one time, he was like, man, this person did me wrong, and I am so mad at him. And, and I looked at him, and I said, yeah, I believe that, but have you asked forgiveness? He's like, what? Ask forgiveness? Do you realize what this guy has done to me? And I said, yeah, but I also realize that you have bitterness in your heart. So maybe you need to go up to them and say, hey, you know what? I have bitterness in my heart would you forgive me and, and see where that takes you? See, boast in your weakness. Boast in the things that aren't right with you and 
that's how you're going to change the world. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here and uh, they'll lead us in a song and then I'll close us in prayer. But I just want you to just, I hope I gave you a, a good perspective of this Stephen thing. You know, a man filled with grace and power and wisdom and a man that God used even when it looked like he had lost everything.